Thank you so much, uh, David, for uh, the introduction to this, what is a, a very important and critical session for this, uh, for this conference. We will be taking some questions, and in fact, when we designed this session, it was originally going to be Michael doing a keynote, but then we decided actually it would be good to have a conversation, not just with myself, but also with yourselves as well. So we will be having Q and A's, questions for Michael from the in-person audience, but also online as well. So as we speak, please do drop in your questions online, and we will pick those up. Um, but before we do that, I'll hand over to Michael for his uh, initial thoughts and uh, initial words. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here and to be in conversation. My perspective is social determinants of health. I come at it from that angle rather than particular some other angle. I chaired the World Health Organization Commission on Social Determinants of Health, and we've done, I've chaired commissions in three of the regions, in Europe, in the Americas, and most recently in the so-called Eastern Mediterranean region, North Africa and the Middle East. I want to talk now, though, mainly about Britain, because we keep both the global work and the national work going. And there are three challenges in recent history to health equity. What happened post-2010, um, a dozen years of austerity. The second was the pandemic. And the third is the cost of living crisis. And we need to address the cost of living crisis in the light of the previous two. Uh, not just say, well, can we give poor people a bit more money now, but in light of the previous two. I've been working a lot with local government for a negative and a positive reason. The neg negative reason, <laughs> I was at a gathering on Sunday afternoon, and I'm not quite sure who I was talking to, and... Uh, Somebody asked me, or in fact more than one person asked me, what kind of relationship do you have with Sajid Javid, who was, it feels like ancient history now, but <laughs> was then the Secretary of State for Health. And I said, I have no relation with Sajid Javid. No one in the current government has asked me about anything. I've been asked by the Lib Dem peers in the Lords. I've been asked by the Labour Party, by the Greens, by city regional government, by the government of Wales, by the Scottish Parliament, the one group that's never asked me a question about health equity or health inequalities is the current government. So that was Sunday afternoon. Monday evening, I get an email from Sajid Javid's office <laughs> saying he would like to meet me on Thursday. In fact, I was gonna go from here to Victoria Street to his office. And I said, yeah, I'd be happy to talk to him. So my version of his resignation was it was discovered that he was going to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> and the embarrassment of talking to an expert uh, it was totally inconsistent with the modus operandi of the government, so he had no choice but to resign. There's some other alternate version, something to do with the Prime Minister, but you can discount that version. But it, okay, but it's serious. The government really didn't want to talk to me. So the, the negative reason for working in local areas is that one. The positive reason, the real interest in making a difference. We did our report for Greater Manchester, Cheshire and Merseyside. In September, we'll produce our report for Lancashire and Cumbria, Luton, Waltham Forest. I was in north of Tyne. Their interest in Leeds said, could we be a Marmot city? Uh, Gwent proudly said they want to be the first Marmot region in Wales. We're on the agenda in local government and regional government and in national government, I don't know what a nation is, but in Wales um, and potentially in Scotland. 
Now that's all about social determinants without saying anything particularly about race or ethnicity. And the pandemic for me was crucially important. I mean, I started life looking at ethnic differences. I mean, my first epidemi epidemiological research was on men of Japanese ancestry in Japan, Hawaii, and California, looking at migration. And then I did a monograph when I came to, back to the UK on mortality by country of birth. So that's where I started, looking at ethnic differences in health. And then I got more, obviously, involved in socioeconomic differences. And the pandemic, of course, said, come on, you, you've got to look at this seriously. Um, because the, I'm sure you've already talked about it, the astonishingly high mortality from COVID in black African, black Caribbean, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Indian. That was statistically, in some measure, accounted for by geography, where people lived, level of deprivation of the area, other socioeconomic characteristics, but only in some measure. And my formulation of that, for what it's worth, was as you know, we've been talking about the causes of the causes, and that racism was, in a sense, the cause of the causes of the causes. So why should people of particular ethnicity find themselves in more socioeconomically disadvantaged situations? So that's one way to approach it. And the other is, what else is going on? And it seemed to me the... Uh, I mean, when you've heard me say this before, uh, when those figures came out from ONS and a health minister was on the BBC and he said, we're terribly concerned and people should wash their hands. And I was asked, what did I think? And I said, good advice. And we should deal with structural racism. <clears throat> when should we start dealing with structural racism? This afternoon was my response. Um, and hence the CRED report that coming out was distinctly unhelpful. Uh, the, the CRED report had ample evidence of structural racism in the police, in the education system, in employment. Um, and looking at the evidence, it said there's no evidence. Uh, okay, I've come across that many times before in my scientific life. Um, but they were very helpful in bringing the evidence to the fore. Um, saved a lot of time. You could actually look at the systematic discrimination in education, in school exclusions, in the police, and so on. Uh, and we documented in my COVID-19 Marmot Review, uh, the again, which you know very well, that the high correlation between high-risk occupations for COVID-19 and the proportion of people from different ethnic backgrounds who were employed in those frontline occupations. Now, you, I don't want to get into labels about whether the CRED report would call that structural racism or something else, but it should be of concern, whatever we want to label it, it should capture our attention. Why should people from a particular ethnic background be selectively employ employed in high-risk occupations? And just the last bit of introduction, um, particularly in, David's the expert here, uh, particularly in the US, there's been much more debate than here about is this all socioeconomic or is there something else? And there's no question that if certain ethnic groups are disproportionately represented in lower socioeconomic groups, reducing socioeconomic inequality would benefit those groups. That seems to me pretty clear. But that's clearly not the whole story. And there is something else going on. 
and it's that something else that something else that should exercise us. So my approach to this is yes, the model we have of social determinants of health and addressing racism and discrimination and addressing climate change. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, for those opening thoughts. We'll, we will go to the audience, so please do think about the questions you want to ask, again, both in person and, and also online. But if I may just pick up on your final point in terms of tackling the issues that we have around racism and structural racism, Michael, what do you think leaders across society need to do practically in order to ensure race equity and the tackling of the inequalities that we see and to build back fairer? So let me start with the Build Back Fairer. The reason I gave four reports that title, Build Back Fairer, was because of the dreadful state of health prior to the pandemic. As I said, we've got to think about these three challenges to health equity, a decade of austerity, the pandemic, and the current cost of living crisis. And we were in a dreadful state pre-pandemic. Now, in my 2020 review, we said that we had difficulty, and one of the functions of the Race and Health Observatory is to improve the situation. We had difficulty reporting systematically on ethnic differences in health. We did report on it, but we said they're not good routine data. Um, so it's not terribly exciting to say we need much better data and much better evidence. Uh, so it's not very exciting, but it's a sine qua non um, to say we need better evidence. Um, and my own view, the reason that the current government needs to change, and I try hard, at least in public, not to be party political, but to talk about the evidence. And the evidence is that the settlement badly damaged the health of the country and increased inequalities, socioeconomic and ethnic. So building back fair means a totally different approach. Now, what do we need to do? I had my six domains of recommendations. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning. The third is employment and working conditions. And I've already mentioned, for example, ethnic differences in education and in employment, which are of vital importance. The fourth was having enough money to live on to lead a healthy life. The fifth, healthy and sustainable places. And the sixth was taking a social determinants approach to prevention. And I, as I said a moment ago, have now, because I quite liked having six, but reluctantly have added two more. Not reluctant because they're unimportant. I just didn't want to have eight. But <laughs> the seventh one was tackle racism, discrimination, and their consequences. So that's vital to building back fairer. And the eighth was to pursue the health equity and the climate agenda at the same time. So that's what we need to do. Thank you. And I think the, the theme of data has been kind of a golden thread throughout the, the conference this morning as well, and good quality data. So that's absolutely critical as well. So I'll take some questions for Michael. Uh, please do put up your hands, and we, we will get a, a microphone to you. There's one here. If you can say your name as well, please. I will do, Habib. Uh, I'm Bren, Bren McInerney. I just volunteer in my local community and also a member of the Race and Health Observatory Stakeholder Engagement Group, both of which I'm extremely proud of. So um, it's a bit of a comment and a question, really. So I'm just wondering, Michael, really, um, how you think we can change some of the mindsets of our leaders that still have quite a hierarchical approach to engaging with people in communities that I see quite often. And secondly, and whatever really, I pick up evidence day after day after day by walking the streets and speaking with people in communities. And I'm just wondering how 
we can move that um, measurement base really to really listening to our communities that all that all give us that information we've just got to be better connected so probably two more statements than questions um, but a, that's what I experience locally quite often well how do we change the attitude of our leaders I haven't a clue I know our democracy is in a dire state it's a terrible position um, I was talking to a group um, called the People's Powerhouse. Uh, so they set themselves up across the north, as it were, in opposition to the northern powerhouse, um, which they said all that infrastructure isn't going to do a bit of good for the health of our population. And I said that my private wish was that we get so many local areas all engaged in pursuit of a fairer settlement of health equity that the national government would have to follow. The whole, government, the whole population would be moving in one direction and governments would do what they commonly do is they'd run round to the front of the march and pretend they were leading it. Um, and, that would, and they said, that might be your private wish, but you just said it publicly, so it's now your public wish. Well, okay. Because my experience, and I think you're reflecting that, um, a different set of attitudes is not hard to find um, at city level, at regional level, at local level, among community groups. Uh, a real desire for a different settlement. And we're just not hearing that publicly. Um, I mentioned that I d I'll talk to politicians in government, in opposition, or whatever. Uh, I was briefing the shadow cabinet, um, and a senior politician said, in a way, your question, how do we get our message across? And I said, certain things come with age and experience, and one of them is knowing what I'm no good at, and I'm certainly no good at telling pot politicians how to communicate. But I can tell you what I do. I tell the truth. I argue from the evidence. And I engage people in a discussion about social justice. I think that's what we have to do. We have to tell the truth, argue from the evidence, and what we're trying to create are more just societies. Thank you so much, Michael. And we have another question in the audience. And then I'll, after that, I'll go to my colleagues at the back. And I think we've got a couple of questions online as well. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, my name is Maxine McIntosh, uh, and I'm from Genomics England. Um, my question is something that came up at the beginning of your um, comments, and it's also something that came up during the coffee break earlier, which is that when we look at equity, we have to look at lots of different dimensions and discrepancies across lots of different dimensions and of course intersectionality is incredibly important but intersectionality involves lots of time and lots of data and lots of pivot tables and can get quite overwhelming quite quickly. So can I ask you what you feel the risks and benefits are of taking a, a small lens or a singular lens of for example race on thinking about questions of inequity and on one hand a singular lens can sh tr sh show a true story on the other hand, it can obfuscate a, a real story of inequity. So I'd love to kind of get your take on, on many lenses versus singular lenses. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, the honest answer is that as I've walked along this path, I haven't done it from a highly theoretical standpoint. Um, I've done it with looking at the evidence um, and engaging in discussion. In our uh, com commission of the Pan American Health Organization on equity and health inequalities in the Americas, I'll caricature the conversation slightly. I was talking to a professor in Canada who herself was First Nations Canadian. And 
I'm caricaturing, but um, I said to her, oh, I can understand your problem. You know, I've got this model and it, f it applies always and everywhere about social determinants of health. And she took the line, I said I'm caricaturing, you're really ignorant, but you're worth educating. Um, <laughs> she wasn't as blunt as that, but uh, much more polite. But you're worth educating. She said, what you're missing out in, th in relation to First Nations people in Canada is our relationship to the land, our culture, our history, the impact of colonialism. And I thought, I never thought that I would author a WHO report where we talked about the effect of ongoing colonialism. But I did. I was persuaded by the argument. So I didn't approach it and say, oh, colonialism's terrible. I mean, I think colonialism wasn't great. So, But that's not how I approached it. I was persuaded by the argument, by the evidence we were looking at. Throughout the Americas, indigenous peoples had worse health than non-indigenous. People of African descent had worse health than people not of African descent throughout the Americas. So it wasn't just relationship to land of indigenous peoples. There was clearly something else going on, um, which we said was structural racism. So I approached it because I thought I had a good explanatory model that explained everything that Commission on Social Determinants of Health. And it was pointed out to me that it didn't explain everything. Um, there were some things that didn't, I mean, I could have twisted around, said, oh, it's really there, but it wasn't. So uh, I moved in that direction. I didn't start saying we've got to think about intersectionality. But when I looked at the data, if you were of African descent in many countries in the Americas and a woman and of low socioeconomic standing, you were much worse off than if you had only one of those things. And I don't think I'd even heard of intersectionality when I started looking at those data. So that isn't, you know, that's not the lens. I'm not, I'm not a naive empiricist, but the evidence is really important. So I came to this from a different angle. And we have a session on indigenous communities um, a little later on in our program as well. But I wonder whether there's a question online, and I'll go over to my colleagues. Hi, uh, yes, we've got loads of questions from online, but in interest of time, there's one from Critty saying, given the UK government report on COVID-19 racial inequities invokes race medicine by referring to genetic differences, how do we ensure that NHS organisations and academics do not pander to the narratives of biological essentialism? How do I ensure that people don't <laughs> do that? Um, I mean, I've been arguing this, um, the two most common arguments that I've been having, uh, there was a lovely New Yorker cartoon I saw recently, a teenager is yelling at her mother saying, whether it's nature or nurture, it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> so whether it's nature or nurture, it's your fault. So the two most common arguments I've been having uh, throughout my professional life is, is it nature or nurture? You know, which is your, that question is a version of it. And of course it's both. Uh, and with economists who think the causal arrow goes from health to the economy, not from the economy to health. And of course it's both. But, um, but to argue one side of that equation is quite wrong. It's just inconsistent with the evidence. Um, and to think that you can explain everything on basic biological characteristics is not correct. The evidence points against it. I did a quite an interesting debate. Um, I had to read her book, um, Paige Harden. Yeah, um, but she wrote a book, I think it was called The Genetic Lottery. Um, and they did an event at UCL and I was asked to, to debate her and I thought, well, I wouldn't have read the book otherwise, so it's a good reason to read the book. And we had a fun time. She's a behavioral geneticist. 
Um, so her perspective is how important genes are in determining behavior and everything. And I came at it from a different angle. But you know, I'm open to her point of view. She was open to my point of view. We had a fun time. And what the data she's assembled show directly that within a particular genetic propensity by doing a GWAS score, you know, multiple genome, whatever, um, genome-wide association studies, within a, div a given biological propensity, the social environment really matters. And within, to put it the other way, within a particular socioeconomic category, um, the genetic predisposition really matters. And so we had a real meeting of the ways. It was quite productive. And uh, she had lots of interesting data uh, which bear on it. So my approach, um, as always, is how do I stop people? Well, I can't stop people thinking a different way, but I can argue from the evidence. And the evidence suggests that a simple biological explanation of, for example, ethnic differences is inadequate to the task. It doesn't explain what we observe. I wonder if we can take one final question from the room, if there is one. One, yes, at the front. We've got the microphone coming across. I have a loud voice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, lovely to see you, Michael. Um, I'm chair of the Northamptonshire Integrated Care Board, and our problem is that we're rich. So I find that the social justice argument, which I've done nationally most of my career, and which I've, I know every single poor neighborhood in England, all of a sudden I'm faced with a bigger community that basically doesn't have the experience of poverty except in very small pockets, and doesn't have the experience in terms of race except in very small pockets. So I find politically it's quite hard to get the social justice argument going. And I just wonder if you can give me some ammunition of other arguments. The interesting thing is that even when you look at the data, and we have good data, England average is not good enough for Northamptonshire. Because if, if we look at your social class gradient, we shouldn't be England average because we're rich. Well, uh, so uh, firstly, truth in Everett, Naomi and I have known each other for a very long time. You know, uh, as, good friends. as good friends, oh, absolutely. And I was, I worshipped what she did as um, sure start uh, being involved from the very beginning. So uh, we had dare I say it, a mutual admiration. Um, <laughs> um, I would argue, if I were talking to your um, council, I would argue from the gradient. I would say people second from the top have worse health than those at the top, and it goes all the way down. I mean, I heard a discussion on the moral maze. Um, I was listening on a podcast during my daily walk on the BBC, and they were talking about inequality and poverty. And I wanted to scream at them, look at the data, you know, look at the evidence of the gradient. It's not just about poor people. It's about inequalities. It's about where you sit in the hierarchy. And uh, people in the middle ought to be breaking down the barricades because their health is not as good as people at the top. Um, and so that would be the argument that I would make. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you on the RHO board, Michael, and it's been an honor to have you here with us today. Thank you for telling the truth, for arguing uh, with the evidence, and for the engagement that you've highlighted, which needs to be, as you say, sustained and meaningful with our communities uh, going forward. Thank you so much, Sir Michael Marmot.